We're looking today at another story that Jesus told as we go through the secrets of the kingdom from Matthew chapter 13. Today we're looking at the wheat and the tares. If you have a bulletin, I invite you to open it up. If you have a smartphone, when you're done advertising VBS for us, and I appreciate those of you who took pictures of the VBS uh, flyers last week and put them on your Facebook page. Still time to do that, by the way. Um, and you can do that to let people know for tonight. Or if you don't want to take a picture, you can just take the uh, the cover of our church Facebook page. I've already shared it. And you can go to that and share it and, you know, do that. When you're done doing all that, after we've started the week, take this invite card for the Secrets of the Kingdom because it's good through August, okay? And in the same way that you took a picture of the VBS flyer and put it on your Facebook page, you can take a picture of this. And that way, uh, your friends, all the people on Facebook will see all the messages that they can still get in on from now through the end of August. Secrets of the Kingdom from Matthew chapter 13. We always give a big idea. And the big idea for today's message is a very important one. Very important one. Because I'm afraid I have to say, including myself in the we, using the editorial we, we all are guilty of making judgments that are not our responsibility to make. We all do that. And Jesus knew that as he spoke to his disciples, and that's why he told them this story. Now let's get the big idea, which is God will separate the true believers from the fakes. That's his job, not mine. Say that together with me. God will separate the true believers from the fakes. That's his job, not mine. One more time. God will separate the true believers from the fakes. That's his job, not mine. Let's just jump right into the story, and we'll see Jesus telling the story and then explaining it. So, in your outline, what was the story of the wheat and the weeds? The word tares means weeds. I used it in the title for the sake of the people who knew the Bible. What was the story of the wheat and the weeds? Well, you find it in Matthew 13, beginning at verse 24. Jesus told them another story. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who planted good seed in his field. That night when everyone was asleep, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and then left. Later, the weeds sprouted. The heads of grain grew, but the weeds also grew. Then the man's servants came to him and said, You planted good seed in your field. Where did the weeds come from? The man answered, An enemy planted weeds. The servants asked, Do you want us to pull up the weeds? The man answered, No. No. Because when you pull up the weeds, you might also pull up the wheat, let the weeds and the wheat grow together until the harvest time. At harvest time, I will tell the workers, First gather the weeds, tie them together to be burned. Then... Then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. Now, there's the story. Jesus told a lot of stories because he would take familiar facts that people knew about and he would lay them alongside. The word parable means to lay something alongside something else, to take a story of what's familiar, put it alongside something else to make a truth known, to help it to be understood. And that's what Jesus did with these parables. So what was the explanation? Jesus explains this parable. He did not explain all the parables. He explained the parable of the sower, and he explained this parable. So let's look and see what Jesus' explanation was, all right? If you want to get the explanation of the parable of the tares, as it's called in the King James. You go to verse 36. 
Matthew 13, 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. The multitude, they weren't really interested. Now, they, they liked to see what Jesus could do, but they weren't really truly seeking him. The disciples, however, were different. And so his disciples came to him and they said, explain to us, please, the parable of the wheat and the tares, the weeds of the field. So in verse 37, Matthew 13, 37, Jesus begins his explanation. And we just list them for you, the different parts of the parable, the different personages and places, and tell you what Jesus said. First of all, the sower. Who is the sower in this story? Verse, t verse 37, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. That's Jesus Christ. So in this parable, Jesus Christ himself is the sower. Matthew 4.23 says, Jesus went everywhere in Galilee preaching the good news about the kingdom of heaven. That was his message. He preached the good news, the words about the kingdom of heaven. Now, it's very interesting. In the book of Daniel, for those of you who know the prophet Daniel and know Bible prophecy, in Daniel 7.13, he's identified as the one who received a kingdom. Daniel said in Daniel 7.13, I was watching in the night visions. And behold, a watch, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. He was given, watch, authority, glory, and the strength of a king. People of every tribe, nation, and language will serve him. His rule will last forever, and his kingdom will never be destroyed. His kingdom will never be destroyed. That's how we know this is not an earthly king. Because this kingdom is never going to be destroyed. The prophet said. Now, after Jesus ascended to heaven, he received that authority. Revelation 3.21, I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Revelation 3.21. So the sower is Jesus Christ, who has a kingdom. Now, where's the field? The sower sowed seeds in the field. The field is the world, verse 38. Verse 38, the field is the world. That's where the Son of Man came to sow the seed. Now, it's not the church. Some people try to say it's the church. No, it's not the church. Say, how do you know it's not the church? I know it's not the church because if it was the church, Jesus would have said that the field is the church. Like he said in other places in Matthew, right? In, in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, I will build my what? Church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus knew the word church and used the word church when he meant that. He didn't mean church here. All right? He meant the world. Now watch. The church is in the world. That, that's right. So we're not, let, we're not leaving the church out, but we're saying it's not just exclusively the church, okay? It's the world. Now, here's where it gets uh, interesting because this parable is different than the parable of the sower of the seed. Because who did Jesus mean by the good seed? The wheat. Now, watch this. The good seeds. Not the same as the parable of the sower. The good seeds, verse 38 are the sons of the kingdom. The good seeds are the sons. That's why we could say this is kind of mixed metaphors when you put the stories together. Because in the parable of the sower, what was the seed? Anybody remember? The word of God, God's word. Here, these disciples, they're the ones that Obviously, from the parable of the sower were good soil, where the word of God was sown, and it came forth to bring good fruit that lasted forever. In the parable of the wheat and tares, the disciples are the good seed themselves. So, 
Here's what we conclude then. When one receives the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, then they become good seed. They become sons of the kingdom. What about the tares? Who are the tares? Notice again, Jesus' explanation, verse 38. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Now, that's defined as those who practice lawlessness in verse 41. They offend and practice lawlessness. These are unsaved people. They are, but watch, they're within the realm of the Lord's reign. Because later they're going to be gathered out of his kingdom, but they're not obviously obeying the king's authority. So they are the sons of the wicked one. They're sons of the enemy. Now, who's the enemy? The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The enemy, verse 39, who sowed them is the devil. Now, the devil, we know, tried to tempt Christ, right? And failed. How many times did the devil try to tempt Jesus? Three times. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Satan came and tried to tempt Jesus, to bow down and worship him. That failed. So he now tries to destroy the efforts of Christ, who, of course, came to save souls and enlarge his kingdom. And he does this by planting weeds, his children, among the wheat, God's children. What's the harvest mean? Well, again, Jesus gives it for us there. The harvest is the end of the age, the end of the age. The gospel of the kingdom, the age in which that's being preached. People who receive the gospel become sons of the kingdom. They have to be saved, they have to be born again. What did Jesus say in John 3 to Nicodemus? He said, except a man be what? Born again, he cannot see the what? Kingdom of God. So. That's the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And to be a true son of the kingdom, you have to be born from above, born of God. Who are the reapers in this story? The reapers are the angels. And Jesus tells us that. The reapers, verse 39, are the angels. The angels accompany Christ when he comes again. How do I know? 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 says, God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord Jesus Christ appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God, on those who refuse to obey the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. Now, no, notice that. We're going to talk about applications of all this. That'll be the bulk of the message here. But we've got to get the story and how Jesus explained it. But notice here, they will be punished, those who refuse to obey the good news of the Lord, with eternal destruction. By the way, if you believe in eternal life, you have eternal salvation, right? Eternal life, eternal salvation. You can't really, as a true Christian, believe in eternal life and eternal salvation and not believe what Jesus said about eternal, what? Punishment. And there's a bunch of people today trying to do that, trying to have it both ways. And you can't do that, not be true to the Bible. Now, you can make up your own if you want, and that's a lot of people are doing, right? And some of those people are counterfeit Christians or weeds, okay? Now, let's get into the application for us today. What are, what are the truths that we glean from this parable? It's like, so what, okay? That's, that's what you need to understand. What's the so what? Because you got to know and let me just explain something to you about interpreting the Bible. 
you have to understand, first of all, what it meant when it was written. And you say, how do you figure that out? You figure it out by study. Study to show yourself approved to God. So you cannot take verses and just yank them out of context and say this is what this means if it's not what Jesus meant it to mean. So you have to know first what it meant when it was written. And then when you know that, then you can correctly say, okay, what does it mean for us today? Well, so here's what it means for us today. The tares, the weeds, are false Christians. Or fakes. Fake Christians. That's what Jesus said. He said the devil sows weeds. Among the wheat. Who's the wheat? The wheat was sons of the kingdom. And the devil sows the tares, the weeds, among the sons of the kingdom. So they're false, if you please, sons of the kingdom. They're counterfeit Christians. So here's, there's kind of good news and bad news here. Satan cannot uproot. He can't destroy the life of a true Christian. You understand what I mean? He can't take away your eternal life. He can't. He doesn't have the power. That's why I know that every person who's truly a born-again child of God is going to be in heaven for eternity because they have eternal life that lasts forever. So you don't have to ever doubt that. You can't do anything to get yourself saved, so you don't do anything to keep yourself saved. You know say, you got you to work at keeping saved. No, no, you can't work at keeping saved. What does that mean? See, by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace you're saved through faith, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. What's the next verse say? Not of works. So salvation is all of grace. It's not of works. From the beginning to the end. Now, because Satan can't uproot the plants, the true Christians, he plants counterfeit Christians in their midst. What's the purpose? To create deception and confusion. And also to keep people from truly believing, because you know what they do? They look at counterfeit Christians and they say, oh, well, look at that person. They say they're a follower of Jesus Christ and they live the same as me. Why do I need to be like them? I'm already like them. Why do I need their religion? That's the purpose. Just cause a lot of confusion. Now, Jesus Christ is sowing true believers in all these various places so we could bear fruit. John 12, 24 says that it bears much fruit. But here's, the, again, the sad news is whenever Christ, wherever Christ sows a true Christian, Satan comes and sows a counterfeit. So here's the, here's the lesson for us. We must beware of Satan's counterfeits. We need to watch out. He has counterfeit Christians, for example. 2 Corinthians 11.26, Paul said he was in danger from false brethren, false brothers. False. So Satan has counterfeit Christians who believe a counterfeit gospel. In Galatians 1, 6 to 9, that's a very interesting passage. Paul says, and I'm going to just quote it here. Paul says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you under the grace of Christ unto another gospel, and watch, which is not another, it's not really the gospel, but there's some people that trouble you would pervert the gospel of Christ. And then Paul said this, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than what you already received, which was the gospel of Jesus Christ, let him be cursed. And he says, as I said it before, I'm going to say it again. And then he repeats himself, says the same thing. So he's saying, don't fall for some counterfeit gospel, because it's not really the gospel, it's a fake. 
Have you heard any fake gospel messages being preached on radio or TV? I have. You say, well, how would you know? I'll show you how. You measure it against this book. You measure it against the true gospel. For example, here's, I'll give you an illustration of a counterfeit gospel. I don't, I don't need to name any names this morning because I'd leave somebody out. That's why I'm not going to name names. Okay. <laughs> There's too many. But here's the counterfeit gospel. Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus and you'll never be sick again and you'll have lots and lots of money, all the money that you ever want. And then name some luxury car. That'll be parked in your driveway and you'll be set for life. That's being preached as gospel, right? That's not the gospel. Here's, here, I'll, I'll prove it's not the gospel to you by telling you what Jesus said that's in direct contradiction to that. He said, if any man will come after me, let him deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. He didn't say, follow me, and you'll never get sick. Now, listen, I'm not for sickness, okay? I don't like sickness. But let me just explain something to you. If, if God didn't want anybody to be sick, then God's got the power just to keep people from getting sick. That's, that point eludes people. People say, Jesus wants everybody to be healed. Well, why don't Jesus just keep everybody from getting sick? I mean, that's not so far-fetched. That's no more far-fetched than saying that Jesus wants everybody healed. I already told you, God can heal anybody anytime he wants to. Okay? He healed my father by taking him to heaven. That was perfect healing. All right? I'm not being smart or flippant about it. I'm just trying to help you understand. I've prayed for people, and some of them have been healed and didn't have their disease. One gentleman is still alive down in a nursing home with his wife, Bob and Reva Finical, down in Delaware. He was elder in our church for many years. He had prostate cancer, and it was bad. And he asked us to pray for him, and we did, and he got healed. It was no big rock, it was no big deal. We didn't make any big deal about it. But I pray for a lot of people, and they've not been healed by the disease. God saw fit to take them to promote them to glory, all right? So don't believe any counterfeit gospel, whether it's about prosperity. And again, I'm not telling you that everybody has to be poor. What I'm saying is you don't get saved to get rich or to get healthy. You get saved to have your sins forgiven. You get saved to become a child of God. You get saved so you can spend eternity with God in heaven. That's why you get saved. Any other blessing God wants to give you, that's, that's up to him. That's fine. So you, there's a counterfeit gospel. Satan, of course, encourages a counterfeit righteousness, Romans 10, 2, and 3. There, Paul talks about those who are ignorant of God's righteousness going about to establish their own righteousness, and they're not submitted to God. Now, Satan even has a counterfeit church. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 9, in writing to the letter to the church at Smyrna, John writes of those who are the synagogue of Satan, the church of Satan. And he wasn't talking about Anton LaVey's church either. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15, it says that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light and his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. And so he'll produce then a counterfeit Christ, Satan will. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12. It's also known as the man of sin, the, the son of perdition. A false Christ, a false Messiah. Jesus warned in Matthew 24. He said, in the last days, many false Christs will arise. John gave the same warning, saying, I am Christ, and they'll deceive many. So we have to stay awake so Satan's ministers don't get into the true fellowship and do damage. In 2 Peter 2, he talks of false prophets among the people. 
In 1 John 4, 1 to 6, he talks to many false prophets who are going out into the world. Verse 6 says we can know. Now watch this. Here's a good phrase for you. 1 John 4, 6 says, John says, you can know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. You know how you know the spirit of truth? The Holy Spirit of God who wrote the Bible reveals it to you through God's word. And I'm not afraid to say to people, look, I don't expect you to believe it because I say it. Believe it because it's God's word. Check it with the word of God. Okay? Don't just accept it because, you know, well, I like that guy because he, you know, he, I like his preaching. That's not, that's not the point. And, and folks, we're, we're in a day and age when there's a lot of people who are turning away from a lot of ministers, I'm sad to say, are turning away from this book when, the, when parts of it aren't popular. And one of, them, one of the unpopular parts is in today's message, another one's not. The whole, let's, and I'll take, take the one that's not first to, to give you the illustration. You got, I'm, I'm, a, I'm saddened at how many preachers I'm reading about, so-called evangelical preachers, who now are saying, well, maybe same-sex marriage is okay, and maybe we should do that, and I guess I could do that. Well, they might. They might, and, and some are, but God didn't change the Bible. See, the Bible still says that God ordained marriage to be between a man and a woman, period. Isn't that what the Bible says? Now, that doesn't mean that we hate people who are living their lives in disobedience to the word of God, but are not going to change what we practice or believe just because these people happen to be family members or friends or nice guys or nice you don't change what you believe in the Bible you don't have a see people today have a religion of convenience they believe it as long as it's convenient if it becomes inconvenient then they say well I don't believe that anymore God's taught me tolerance God's taught me to be more loving guess what nobody's as loving as God is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. So God loved the world. God loves you and me unconditionally. That There's no more greater love than that. And yet God still says what he says in the Bible about various sins. Another truth that we glean from this story. And this is one that we miss. Some people say, why does Christ suffer so long with the wicked? Why does he come in judgment? Why does he judge people? Well, one reason Christ is long suffering is so you can grow. See, we don't think about this one. But Jesus said, let the sons of the kingdom, let the wheat grow. And it was out of concern for the wheat that the weeds were allowed to remain, Matthew 13, 29. So God wants you and me to grow. You know what the word grow means in the Bible for Christian? It's a word you don't like, change. Everybody here who loves, uh, I'll, I'll make it even stronger. Every liar here who loves change, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> if we don't love change, nobody loves change. <laughs> Unless a little kid loves pocket change, but nobody loves to change, do we? We don't like to get out of our comfort zone. But the message of the Bible is that God wants to change us. He wants us to be conformed, made like his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was perfect. I got a lot of changing to do to become like that. So do you. 
We all do. So the Christian life is a life of change. And so Christ is long-suffering so you and I can grow. And, of course, he's also long-suffering because he doesn't want the wicked to perish. 2 Peter 3, 9. God, the Bible says, 2 Peter 3, 9, Jesus is long-suffering. He's not slack concerning the promise of his coming, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that's another reason for his long suffering, because he wants people to get saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, here's, here's another application that, again, you're not going to hear much today because this is really unpopular, but it's the truth of the Bible. A place of punishment is the reward of the wicked. That was taught in the parable of the dragnet. We're going to see that when we get to Matthew 13, 49 to 50. It's also taught in the parable of the unforgiving servant, Matthew 18, 34 and 35. And in the judgment scene in Matthew 25, 41. Now, if you don't have these verses marked in your Bible, let me strongly encourage you to go to your Bible and mark these verses now. Because until God cuts these verses out of the Bible, I'm going to believe and preach that there is a real place called hell, a place of eternal punishment. Matthew 25, 41. Then the king will say to those on his left, go away from me. You'll be punished. Go into the fire that burns forever. That was prepared for. Now get this. Prepared for the devil and his angels. So God did not make hell, the everlasting fire, for man. He made it for the devil and his angels. God doesn't want people to perish. That's why he sent Jesus. Christ did not, John 3, Jesus Christ did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. That's the whole purpose of the gospel. But what if somebody doesn't want to be saved? God says you don't have to be saved if you don't want to, but when you die, you're going to go to a place of eternal punishment. You say, that's not very popular. I, don't, I can't help that. There was a guy that was a big shot preacher, okay? He had a church of 10,000 people until he stopped preaching. He said he didn't believe in hell anymore, okay? And he used to believe it. He didn't believe it anymore, okay? So he's not, he's not at his church. He's become a consultant to the Hollywood celebrities. Yeah, who believe all kinds of various things. And this guy thinks he's helping them out. So if you're going to properly preach the gospel of the kingdom, it has to include a warning to those who don't want to receive the kingdom. And the parable is a warning to you and me not to allow ourselves to be influenced by the wicked one, by the evil one. If you don't have this verse marked in your Bible, you better mark it also. 1 Peter 5, 8. Our adversary is very much seeking to destroy us. Stay alert. King James says, be sober, be vigilant. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Your enemy, the devil. So how do you defeat the devil? Okay, I'll give you a couple of scriptures. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. Paul said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the tricks of the devil. Because we're not simply wrestling against flesh and blood, against people. We're wrestling against principalities and powers, against the rules of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So you can stand against the devil having done all to stand. Is that possible? Yes, it is. 1 John 2, 14. I've written to you, John said, because you are strong, watch, and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2, 14. So God says we can overcome the wicked one. How do we do that? We have to let the word of God abide in us. 
You know what that means? You know what the word abide means there? I'll give you a word for marriage, okay? The word abide. It's the word translated in 1 Peter 3. Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Abide with them according to knowledge. That's the word dwell, okay? Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom. What it means is it's a close it's the it's the deepest word for close. Let the word of God be close to you. Let it be in you. Be familiar with it. Be intimate with it. Know what it says. Why? So you can just uh, impress people by what you know. No, because but guess what? In the world today, people aren't impressed because you know the Bible. That's not that's not to impress people. They don't care. So what? See, in fact, if you tell people you know the Bible, they might be unimpressed by the fact that you are an ignorant ignoramus who just believes this old book full of fairy tales. That's what the world thinks. So you don't know it so you can impress people. You know it so you can stand against the devil. You know it so you can stand on the promises. Let me ask you a question. What promise of God did you claim for yourself in this last week? I'm not asking you to, to embarrass you. I'm asking to help you. See, because the more promises you know, the more promises you can stand on, right? Yeah. I stand on promises every day. Every day when, when we pray together, I, I tell God, I thank him for his promises and tell him how much I'm dependent upon them. Because I'm totally dependent on God's promises to me. Totally. Now, these promises aren't just for me. They're for everybody, every believer. So here's a question, a two-part question. What do you need as a believer right now from God? And is there a promise in the Bible about that? There probably is. There probably is. Now, let's just wrap the story up. The kingdom of heaven began with the Son of Man's first coming, especially with his ascension to the right hand of God and the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. The kingdom of heaven will not be fully culminated until the Son of Man returns with his angels and gathers all things out of his kingdom that offend and practice lawlessness and delivers the kingdom to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. At that time, 2 Peter 1.11 says, we'll have an abundant entrance into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father, Matthew 13, 43. So here's the question. How can you tell if you're wheat or a weed? That's a good question. Well, if you want to shine as the sun in the kingdom of the father, then remember what Jesus said. Here's how he ends it. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And you know what that literally means? He who has ears to hear, listen good. That's what it means. Listen good to God's word, God's spirit. And let's come back to the big idea. Now you say, well, I don't like it that there's fake Christians. Yeah, all right. I don't like it either. Is that my job? To and By the way, there's probably fake Christians. I was teasing with some people, but it's not a joke. It's the truth. In, in every church, not just this church, in every church, even born-again evangelical churches, there are fake Christians. Okay, That's a sad fact. But it's not my job to find them out. It's not your job to find them out. And by the way, this has nothing to do with church discipline and, and talk, dealing with Christians who need to be dealt with. It's not talking about, this is nothing to do with that. That's another whole subject, okay? We're talking about people who aren't even saved here, okay? It's not your job to say, oh, that person's not a Christian because they're living blah, 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 blah. Guess what? You know what I tell people when they say that to me? I say, well, you might be right, but guess what? God's going to deal with that person in the judgment day. See, God's going to take care of that. It's not my job to, to, to convince them they're not saved and then they can get saved. I can't do that. See, you can't do that. 
Only God's Holy Spirit can convict the person, right? So you can pray for people. You can pray that God will work in their heart. I do that all the time. doesn't matter whether they're saved or unsaved. You can pray for God's Holy Spirit to do what only he can do in your young adult person's life who you're concerned about or your grandfather or your grandmother or whoever else. Pray that God will do what he can do. And, but leave the judging about whether they're Christians or not to him. Okay? And then what we need to do is make sure we live our lives so that nobody doubts that we're Christians. Hey, here's a, here's, here's flips it over. If you got arrested for being a Christian, Number one, would they have enough evidence evidence to convict you? Number two, would anybody be surprised? And that's a, that's a quite a thought. Would anybody be surprised if you were arrested for being a Christian? God says, "Look, live your life following my Son Jesus, and live your life abiding in my Word." If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can talk to me, God says. Ask me whatever you will. It'll be done for you, but you need to abide. See? John 15 is all about abiding. Let's abide in him and give the gospel to people who desperately need it. Shall we pray, please? Now, Jesus said, except the man be born again, he will not see the kingdom of God. Have you ever been saved? Have you been born again? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? Do you know that you have eternal life? If you do not know that, or maybe you know you don't have it, but you'd say, I'd like to know that I'm a true child of God through faith in Christ, then I invite you to pray this prayer out of a heart of conviction right now. Just quietly from your heart to God's, pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. Thank you for giving your Holy Spirit to convict me of sin. I do repent of my sins. Thank you for dying for them. Thank you for forgiving me. Come into my life and change me from the inside out. Help me now live my life for you and to tell others about you and what you've done for me. Help me not to be ashamed of you. Thank you for hearing my prayer, for saving me today. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you pray that prayer in a minute, God heard you. God saved you. I'd like to thank him for doing that. Would you lift your hand right now if you prayed that prayer with me a moment ago? By the lifted hand, you're just saying, yes, I pray today to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. All right, Christian friend, I do not know what application the Holy Spirit might have given to you, but if he's speaking to you through his word and there's some place in your life where you need to obey him, Maybe you've been resisting change, the change that Jesus wants to make. I don't know what it is, but if God's spoken to you and you'd say, Pastor Will, pray for me as a true believer that I will be obedient to do what the God's Holy Spirit's telling me to do through his word. Here's my hand. Yes, God bless you and you and you and you. Thank you, Father, for your patience and your long suffering, not only with the, with the weeds, but with us, with believers, with the wheat. Thank you that you are long-suffering. Thank you that you're patient. Help us to be willing to allow you to change us, to be conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to realize that you want us to spread the gospel everywhere. You want us to sow the, the Word of God. And help us not to be afraid to do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Stand.